Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. This is the December 2018 Q&A. All of these questions are provided to us from the $5 and above Patreon supporters. And for all of you supporters directly supporting us financially like this, we are very appreciative. Um, on that note, uh, we are starting with some questions about Patreon. So let me just get the ball rolling because I've got a lot of questions. Just me this month, not Ian. A little bit of travel involved, the holidays and such. So let's get this ball rolling. So regarding Patreon, which is a controversial topic right this moment, and I understand that, so I figured I'd get these two questions out of the way immediately. Mason says, are you going to use a Patreon alternative? And Jan M says, does InRange use any alternatives to Patreon for viewer-funded support? Well, let me, let me explain something here that's very interesting. So when we moved away from advertiser model, the AdSense model, and deleted the AdSense account at InRange, demonetizing the channel ourselves, because we didn't want to accept YouTube's financial support, nor did we want to fight with them about monetization of videos, what should be monetized, what should not. And if you haven't watched my videos on the channel, I do believe that there's an active movement by the old media to assert what is the modern media, things on YouTube, etc. But that's a whole other conversation. What Patreon provided and what the original AdSense model provided was a reasonable expectation of what your monthly income was going to be based on the project. So you look at your advertising money from, say, January to February to March, and it would fluctuate. But based on the average views per channel and without YouTube playing shenanigans, you'd have some sort of dependable amount of income coming in to be able to plan. Like we can go on a trip to SHOT Show or we can go to do Desert Brutality or we can afford to go film a match in Texas or something like that. And when moving to Patreon, Patreon does the same thing. In fact, even more stably than any type of advertising model can and that the direct viewer support uh, is somewhat stable and it allows us to understand what we're expecting to get for the next monthly income refresh. So in that regard, we see we have this many Patreons and we have this much support. It might go down, it might go up, but it's probably not going to go up a lot or go down a lot from one month to another, except it slowly grows or diminishes or whatever. But it's it's something that's you can kind of monitor and get an idea of where you're at. That allows you to do things like we can fund this project or we can acquire this firearm or we can buy this ammunition or we can go on a trip to Texas to do the Tiger Valley two-man team match. And so that's a disruptive technology in that it provided stability to the content creator, but it wasn't ad-based revenue. It was direct viewer support, PBS model, right? And so that subscription slash direct viewer support model provides a lot of benefits, not only to the content creator, but also to the supporter, such as perks, our private Discord server, for example, or when there or Q&A questions, solicitations, etc. And so... Patreon has been a disruptive technology in that it provides the content creator and the content creator supporter tools that weren't there before. Now, that said, InRange has been a huge proponent all along, as I hope you know, about decentralization of content in general and distribution and the internet. So we have long said that YouTube should not be the de facto and only solution for video distribution, and we distribute our content for video content amongst multiple different delivery networks, and you can find them all on InRange.tv. And it's been a huge proponent of what I've been trying to do. And in that regard, it would make sense to also be decentralized in terms of our funding endeavors. Having only one form of crowdsource slash content consumer support being Patreon only, it's not a good idea. It's a single point of failure. Whether Patreon were to fail due to a technological issue or a cultural issue or a political issue, it is still a single point of failure. And so at this moment, uh, there's some controversy going on around Patreon deplatforming a number of content creators. Whether you agree with that or not isn't what I'm going to hear, be here to talk about because that's not my point. My point is decentralization. And we have been watching very carefully for a long time now for alternatives to Patreon. Not to get off of Patreon, just like we're not off of YouTube, but to decentralize that crowdsourced funding solution. And there has of yet not been one. So just because there is a current uh, situation that's causing people to draw more attention to these concerns of Patreon being a single source, that does not mean that InRange can immediately just jump to some other alternative. And in fact, one of the ones that everyone was saying we should go to immediately, go to Subscribestar, go to Subscribestar. Subscribestar already is having problems in terms of their ability to deal with PayPal and credit card processors, as well as, and I don't know if this is fact yet, but there's some information about some strange ownership about who Subscribestar actually belongs to and what its origins are. Um, so it doesn't matter. I don't know if Subscribestar is legitimate or not. I can't answer that question yet. What I do know is that knee-jerk reactions to things in which you change your entire fiduciary funding model on the turn of a dime because of an issue is not a wise one, nor it would have been a wise one for us to leave YouTube, for example. YouTube's shenanigans are things that I'm not happy with or popular with. 
or am I content with, but at the same time, we're not going to leave YouTube because that's where the viewers are. And I have promoted for a long time for people to watch alternatives to YouTube with essentially, honestly, almost no success. People still watch on YouTube. So if we had left YouTube, we would have essentially isolated ourselves and thrown ourselves off the island. And by removing ourselves from Patreon, we would be doing the same thing, but in an even more dangerous way in that the project would no longer be funded. So we're not going to leave Patreon. But if there are alternatives to Patreon coming, or there is one that is viable, then we will absolutely decentralize such funding solutions and we'll be on Patreon and something else, or maybe even something else is, which would be wonderful. It would be good to have more than one. It would be great to have two. It would be great to have three. Um, so in that regard, yes, as soon as there is something viable. At this moment, there is not. And one thing I hear from viewers a lot is, well, I'll just send you know money in an envelope to your P.O. box. And we appreciate any support you're willing to provide us. Of course, don't misunderstand this. But that is not something that we can depend on or rely on. The thing that Patreon does is this monthly cycle. People subscribe to it. It does it automatically. We kind of can depend on what it's going to be. And if we were forced to relegate ourselves to whatever happens to land up in the P.O. box per month, there would be a number of very good will viewers that would do that once in a while. There would be a number of very good will viewers that would just forget. And there were people that would say they would do it and didn't. So it's not a dependable solution. We, of course, appreciate it. If that's what you want to do, awesome. But it's not a solution that would keep this content creator alive, nor would it keep many other content creators sustainable either. So please keep that in mind. So the answer is yes. As soon as there's an alternative that's viable, we'll be on it in addition to Patreon. But it has to be viable. And it can't be something we just jump at because it's new. It has to be something vetted, trusted, and understandable. Thanks. Matthew C. With the Garen nowadays, would you chamber it in 308 or keep it in 30 odd 6? Well, that's an easy answer. If you were going to make an M1 now and you're going to issue an M1 or use one today, there's no reason to not make it in 308. The cartridge is really just as viable and as powerful and as capable as 30 odd 6. And it's more available, more ubiquitous. And there's no reason to keep it in 30 odd 6. 30 odd 6, 308 is really short. 30 odd 6, I know not really, but in a way it, it really is. And um, in terms of performance against M2 ball, essentially equitable. So I would go with 308. Christopher S. Any new projects similar to the Old West Vignettes or the Underground Railroad on the way? Well, Christopher, there's always a project based on something like that on the way. The amount of time and effort to put those out are challenging. And so there's one, in, there's always a couple in, in the works. There's actually two right now. I don't know what the release dates will be, but yes, there are always going to be Old West Vignettes or things like Underground Railroad coming to the channel. A few of them are really interesting and stay tuned because they're, um, Things that are surprisingly have been left out of the historical narrative that the more I research it, the more disturbing it is that it has been. So uh, I know that's a little bit of a teaser, but stay tuned because it's going to be something else. Jordan R. SKSD that uses AK Mags, viable option as a modern carbine. Well, it's not a viable option as a modern carbine. I mean, the SKS is an antiquated design just as the AKM, right? I mean, these are the AKM is really at the bottom end of what I would consider an acceptable, not yet obsolescent combat rifle. It's on that edge. So the SKS that uses an AK mag is almost the equivalent thereof, although a little slower than an AK. They're a little harder to fit and feed um, just because of the nature of the stock and such. But an SKS using an AK mag, um, not really that different than an AKM using an AK mag. So I would say it's viable, yes, but there's no real advantage to it either. Steve P. Are you guys going to SHOT Show this year? Yep, we absolutely are. We'll be there for media day through most of the week. So if you're going to SHOT Show, Hopefully we'll see you there, and I think we're going to try and set up a meet and greet for our Patreon supporters. Um, we'll let you know. Gary Y. Monopod on a mag or traditional hasty sling with an AR? Well, that's an easy one. Monopod on a mag. Monopod on a mag. The, the magazine, really, there's no reason on a properly functioning AR to not be able to rest the gun on the ground on the magazine. If that causes a malfunction in your gun, something's wrong with the mag or the gun. Uh, fix it because you should be able to do that and monopotting on a mag is something you can do dynamically quickly you can get in and out of that position very very fast and efficiently and the hasty sling while it has its place mostly in traditional marksmanship exercises is something hard to use in a practical environment you got to get in and out of it even in a hasty sling and then once you are in it you have to get out of it should you need to so monopod on the mag especially when you're on the ground which of course we're talking about when you say monopod um is is absolutely the definitive choice for me. Phil B, favorite cocktail. This one's pretty easy. It would be an old world Sazerac. So sa I, I, I kind of like the history of cocktails and such. And it's very interesting. Um, the Sazerac is one of the oldest, if not the oldest cocktail. 
at least on the American books. And it was devised by Dr. Pichot, who was a proprietor of patent medicine, uh, his bitters way back when in New Orleans, and he wanted to sell the bitters. And so he came up with this cocktail or concoction, which was brandy or cognac, uh, sugar, usually a sugar cube or some simple syrup by modern standards, a couple dashes of his bitters in a glass that's been rinsed with absinthe and then a little twist of lemon. They're absolutely delicious. Um, there was a huge scourge on the wine industry in France based on the aphid and it destroyed much of the wine capabilities of the wine fields. And when wine became cost prohibitive, so did cognac brandy. And so what happened is there was a transition in New Orleans away from cognac and brandy to rye whiskey for Sazerac. So you have the original Sazerac, which is uh, brandy or cognac, and then it switched to rye whiskey due to cost. Now, if you ask for a Sazerac almost anywhere nowadays, if they even know what that is, you're going to get one based on rye. But if a place is really switched on and you ask for an old world Sazerac, um, they're going to know to make it with cognac or brandy. So uh, that's going to be my choice for sure, and it's always my go-to cocktail. Arthur C. Assuming we enter future where cybernetic augmentations or transhumanism starts becoming viable, do you believe that there will be legislative legal restrictions, and would you be, find yourself willing to augment? Uh, first of all, augmentation and transhumanism is already a thing. There are people getting implants now. There's an implant you can get in your chest that allows you to always detect true north no matter where you are, even underground. Um, there are, I, I know of a person who has an implant in their arm that actually uses their blood pressure or blood flow to spin a little uh, generator and actually have a, a connection to be able to recharge batteries based on their blood pressure or blood flow. Um, of course, there are RFID implants into the hand for authentication, etc. So those are all augmentations in transhumanism. I would say that we also have seen this with um, some sort of artificial limbs. There are people now that have had legs replaced and can run faster than a normal, traditional, organic human being. So uh, let me answer these questions twice. Will there be legislative or both in order? Will there be legislative legal restrictions? Yup, absolutely. Um, I don't know what they'll be. I don't think they're on the radar yet because transhumanism and body hacking hasn't become big enough of a thing for it to become something concerning to the powers that be, not really, but it will happen. And what I find myself willing to augment, absolutely. Um, I think that technology is the future of the evolution of our species and this type of thing done carefully will be something that will take us something further down the path of being greater than we are today. So um, I want my wet wire implant future, quite honestly, and uh, hopefully we'll get there. And hopefully I'll live long enough to be able to find that out. Um, there's a uh, interesting documentary about Ray Kurzweil I think it's called Transcendental Man, talking about some of the body hacking and transhumanism movements and life extension efforts. He's the same guy that made the uh, Kurzweil uh, uh, synthesizer. So uh, I would recommend that documentary if you're interested in that topic. Stefano R. Are you going to be doing any more tasting history videos in the future? Yep, uh, I know we haven't done one of those in quite a long time. We will be doing one again someday soon, um, based on a couple different topics that are pretty interesting. Got a bunch of stuff at home to do that. So yeah, stay tuned. There will be some more tasting history at some point. Jordan K. Has anyone in 2G ACM history used an arm brace for its original purpose? So what I, I think you mean by that is not using it in the stock guys as a poor man's SBR, but actually strapping it to their arm and using it as a pistol. No, there has never been anyone that has used that any of those in that way at two gun action challenge match nor have i ever seen one used like that ever except in the promotional videos so i guess that tells you something matthias fourth time asking sorry here in australia it's kind of hard to get handguns and calibers above 38 9 millimeter not impossible but a pain but we are also limited to 10 round magazines as well with that in mind is there any reason to get a modern double stack polymer 9 millimeter pistol Especially considering that, for example, a 1911 to 9mm with a 9 plus 1 capacity would offer basically the same capabilities and characteristics, except for maybe increased weight. Well, I think you touched on it, increased weight. Uh, the reason to get a polymer would be to decrease the weight, and a good polymer pistol actually does have less recoil, regardless of the reduction of weight, based on the polymer flex. Um, it's hard to explain, but when you fire the gun, it is a real thing. So if you were to ask me, would I rather have a 10-round Glock? or a 10 round or nine plus one 1911? Uh, my answer is quite simply, I would take the Glock. Plus they're more mechanically durable and uh, less prone to malfunctions than the 1911. Sorry. John G. 
worst injury sustained during a match? Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're talking about for me, worst his, worst injury I've ever had or worst one I've seen at the match. Um, for me, I was jumping through the window once and I got my leg caught in the window and cranked it and I continued the stage, but I actually still feel that injury to today. That'd be the worst one I've ever had. Worst one I ever saw was actually at a two-gun match. Um, we had some Marines that came out that shot the match and one of them went down prone to go behind his rifle, went down real hard and continued to shoot the stage even after this happened, but he landed and put his front tooth into the charging handle and cracked it right in half. And during the course of fire, he went, and he spit out his front tooth entirely. Continued the stage and, 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 and finished it. Um, I think that's the worst one I've ever seen. And his charging actual handle actually had a big dent in it, which was kind of brutal. So that'd be my answer for that one. John L. Thoughts on requiring all competitors to have an IFAC or at least a tourniquet on their person during competition, uh, IFAC being uh, individual first aid kit. I don't think it should be required. Um, I would recommend that anyone that's involved in any type of shooting sport, whether they're out in the desert shooting or at a range or in a match, would be at least have some level of medical training. Um, a lot of us want to learn how to shoot real well, but we don't want to learn how to fix things real well. So that would be important to me, I think, just from a... a prioritization of where we should put our time and effort. Uh, would I require everyone to have an IFAC? No. Should there be IFACs available or better than IFACs? Absolutely. If your range doesn't have some sort of first aid capability or you don't have people around that have it, you are sorely missing out. Uh, you are sorely neglecting an important part of your range safety protocol. Matthias L. I have already submitted this question to Forgotten Weapons. Would like to hear your opinion too. Do you think the platform or concept of the Stoner 63 deserves more R&D? Uh, you know, the Stoner R63 was a really compelling gun. Um, Ian just put out a video about it, a pretty good in-depth one about it. And um, it was one of those things that was extremely modular, but I think what was most interesting about it was its ability to have such minimal recoil in its belt-fed role and the belt-fed feed system being very resilient against dirt and debris. I don't know that the Stoner 63 deserves more R&D, but what I would say is that you should look at the video we have here on InRange about the Knight's Light Assault Machine Gun. Uh, Knight's has come out with a new assault machine gun. I guess that's the term they use, Light Assault Machine Gun. And in 5.56, that is a very compelling gun. And I think it is absolutely the um, descendant of the Stoner 63 in concept. So while it may not be the Stoner 63 itself, if you look at the Knight's Light Assault Machine Gun, which we have on the channel, uh, that's, I think, absolutely all those things and more. So, uh, yes, but in a more modern iteration as that design. Lima Dragoon. Asked month, last month. Too long, didn't read. Opinion on the Walther P38. You know, everyone talks about the Walther P38 as being the de facto and definitive jump forward in handguns during World War II. And um, in some ways it was. The double action, single action mechanism was certainly relevant um, the manufacturing of the gun, the locking system was unique, of course, still used today in the Breda 92-M9 pistol by the U.S. Service Army, um, but uh, military services. But um, I don't know that it's that great a gun, really. The double action pull is horrendous. Um, the uh, There are some design flaws in it. The loaded chamber indicator can actually malfunction and cause the gun to fail. Um, there's a top cover that holds all the guts together, which can pop off and fall off, and the gun literally falls apart in your hands. Um, and the Walther P38 was adopted less for its new tactical applications and more for its lower cost of manufacture than its predecessor, the P08 Luger. Um, so if I were to choose a gun in World War II in terms of having the, the best of the World War II available pistols, I actually would not pick the Walther P38. I would pick the Browning High Power. While it didn't have the double action, single action trigger pull system, it had higher capacity and it was nine millimeter as well and it shoots very well and the recoil is really good. And I'd say capacity trumps double action, single action pretty much in every way. Keith K. If you were to go about modernizing a lever action rifle for modern use, what changes would you make it to fulfill this purpose? I'm thinking along the lines of accessorizing or fundamental design changes like changes to the operating action or the like. Well, for speed, I would still go with the toggle link. I mentioned this in a number of our lever gun series videos and the 1876 one, which was up recently. Um, but the Henry toggle link action is the fastest one. It is incredibly smooth, 
very quick, and one of the benefits of a lever action gun is the ability to apply nearly semi-automatic level rates of fire with a manually operated action, which the toggle link does. So I would stick with a toggle link. If I were to modify things, I think what would be good to modify would be to provide a magazine feed capacity with a toggle link system, as opposed to the tube fed, as well as some sort of augmentation of the sighting system, probably a red dot. Um, so if you were to add a red dot and a magazine feed to a toggle link Winchester or Henry style action, I think you'd have a very compelling gun. Kyle T. This is a re-ask, but in your opinion, what is the best all-around semi-automatic pistol caliber carbine for competition defenses use or range toy? Uh, AR-15s, K Arms makes one in 9mm, it's phenomenal. Um, as long as it takes Glock mags, you don't want to use any of those weirdo mags. If you can get a, a 9mm AR system that's using Glock mags, that's the winner. Once again, the AR ergonomics and controls and general inline design of the AR trumps everything as usual, and the Glock mags are oh, very reliable. So that'd be my answer. Molly, assuming you had the funds and access to a gunsmith with appropriate skills, what do you think about the possibility of a Colt Walker conversion or revolver of a similar scale chambered in 4560? A true horse pistol for the cavalry. No, I wouldn't go there. Um, 4560 is a powerful cartridge, not that much less powerful than 4555, 4570. It's meant for a rifle. Could you put a put that in the revolver? Yes, but it makes the revolver impractical. Um, I think your sidearm becomes your sidearm. It's your secondary. And while I understand why the Walker existed, the reality is I think the secondary should be secondary. And I would recommend having it chambered in 45 Schofield or 45. Um, the 1877 cartridge, which was 45 Colt downloaded, essentially. So, um, no, I would not go there. Christopher B. After the disaster that was your weapon choice with this year's Red October match, have you given thought to next year? Back to an AK? Or are you going to try and find something else wild and strange? If you didn't watch the Red October series, I used a VZ-52. Something was wrong with Czechoslovakia in 1952. They designed a really bad rifle and a really bad pistol. And the rifle not only was having issues on the match, it actually broke at the match. Um, I subsequently fixed it, by the way, and it's still viable and functional again. But that gun looks on paper better than an SKS because it's mag-fed, but in practice, it's not. Uh, would I choose something else for Red October? I don't know if I'm going to go to the next Red October. This year's Red October was so much downplayed to more of a festival and less of a match. I'm more interested in the match than I am the festival, so I don't know if I would go. I might go just to cover it versus shoot it. Uh, if Red October stays in that guise, I may not shoot that particular event and use that time for something else. Uh, would I go with something weird? I would go with something weird, sure, because uh, in range is about that. We take out the weird guns and we put them on the clock and on video for you and for us to learn about. So just going there with another AK is just being another competitor with an AK. And that's not what I'm always interested in. Nick C. This is an interesting question. Can an AR-15 gas tube be crimped to fix an over gas system? You know, uh, boy, that's a hack, isn't it? Um, I would, I'm gonna go ahead and say in theory, Yes. Um, what you're trying to do is, of course, decrease the amount of gas going back into the bolt carrier group. Um, I have had adjustable gas systems. I had a carbine that I shot so much that there was so much throw and or there was so much gas port erosion that it was wildly overgassed. And I put in a gas restrictor tube. You can buy gas tubes that have like a dial on them. You can restrict them, which is essentially a screw, which would be no different than crimping. Really, a crimp, of course, would be imprecise, and the screw could be adjusted up and down for how much gas you want to cut off. And I essentially had to set it to the off setting and the gun cycled reliably at the off setting. Now this gun at this point was like eight MOA. It was shot out. It was an interesting experiment. So if a screw going down into the gas tube could reduce the gas flow to mitigate an over gas system, crimping the tube should in theory be able to do the same thing. Serious hack, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's an interesting question. So my answer is, um, yeah, I think it could. Brian I, what is your overall goal in competition? Knowledge, experience, or first place? Um, knowledge, you, you actually you have it in the right order. <laughs> um, already there. Uh, my first goal is knowledge. I bring out interesting and weird guns, and I want to learn about what it's like to use them, um, even off the clock, or on, excuse me, off video. Sometimes I do that when it's not an in-range video. Um, using interesting guns at matches is an interesting way to learn about the practical handling of the gun, which then lends itself to experience. So experience Knowledge, learning, experience is how what it is to use the gun, and first place is absolutely tertiary. Obviously, I want to do well. It's nice to bring out a good gun and succeed. Um, it's nice to bring out a bad gun and succeed. 
it's always nice to succeed. Every once in a while, bringing out something that's competitive and actually being or attempting to be first place has its place in the world, but it's certainly not my priority. Matt S. Thoughts on a 3X Trigicon ACOG for a what would style do carbine? A TA-33 specifically. I don't see it. Um, I think fixed magnification is something that's had its place and it should be pretty much done with. If you want magnification, I would recommend a variable like the Trigicon that we put on ours, the one to four or the one to eight, or one to, excuse me, one to six or one to eight, um, or a red dot or a red dot with a magnifier. But I think fixed magnification is very limiting, especially when stuff gets in close. And so fixed magnification is good from, from certain distance out to a certain distance out. And that's where you're at. If you could throw on a variable that goes from one to eight, why not have the one and the eight? So I would say not really, I wouldn't recommend it. Carl V, I asked this last month, Finish Brutality 2019, still a thing? Yep, still a thing. Working with Varus Delaka and our friends over in Finland about it. Don't have the exact things pinned down yet, but there should be a Finish Brutality 2019 coming. Leslie W. In the videos, I've seen various competitors put up about Finish Brutality. It seems that the most common rifle was an AR type platform. Was that truly the case? I was assuming R RK series rifles would be in the majority. Uh, nope. Finland does have a sport shooting community, competition shooting community, and they have done exactly what every other competition shooter has done and picked the best rifle for that, and that's the AR-15. So the AR was the most common rifle at Finnish Brutality, absolutely. Nick H. Is making a military omnigun to fit all roles a worthwhile effort? Uh, not only is it not a worthwhile effort, it's a fool's errand. Uh, they've tried to do this over and over and over and over again. Maybe you've watched Ian's videos recently about the XM8 and the and the uh, OCIW or whatever. Nope, this is never going to happen. Um, there is no gun that fits all roles. That does not exist, not a real thing. So you could diminish the amount of guns in the inventory to specific roles and have the smallest number possible, but you certainly cannot make one that does everything. There is no jack of all trades that masters anything. So I think that is not a worthwhile effort. Dr. Yorma Wom Chubby. <laughs> when you were reloading for high power, what things did you find actually made a difference in the accuracy of your loads? Um, the jump from the land from the from the cartridge, the free bore from the from the bullet, the projectile to the lands and grooves. The closer you could get consistently. Um, the ogive to the lands and grooves, that was what made the biggest difference, especially at the long range distances like 600. So some people even jam their bullets where they, sh they seat them long and don't crimp. And then when they seat the round, it actually pushes the cartridge, the bullet into the case, thus jamming into the lands and grooves slightly. That can cause an overpressure situation. So I would not recommend that unless you're a very experienced reloader. I didn't do that. But what I liked to do was make sure that my ogive overall length was the same on every cartridge and that mattered far more than powder charge um, or even cartridge length. Uh, overall length and ogive length and jump did, overall cartridge length did not, case length I should say, um, powder charge did not, primers did not, um, and projectile choice. So those two would be the projectile you used and the, uh, the jump to the lands and grooves. Those are the things that made the most difference, especially at long range. Um, let's see what we got here. Herc, is there any reason to choose a fixed power magnified optic over? No, I answered this, Herc. If you I just answer this question, I'm sorry, it's kind of redundant. Um, do not go fixed power anymore. Go with a low power variable or red dot. Will W, how important is it to zero a magnifier behind a red dot? Uh, it's important to verify and clarify. So I would zero with the magnifier employed, so that way you have a better sight picture or you get a better image of what you're aiming at. Zero with the magnifier there then take the magnifier off and confirm your zero and make sure there wasn't some sort of shift. It's possible for some optics or magnifiers to cause a zero shift, so I would be careful with that in terms of how you perceive things. It's not really changing the zero of the red dot, of course, but it could change some stuff. So it's not very important, but I would say it's, I would recommend zeroing with the magnifier and then confirming zero after you remove it. Teddy, Crypto Wars, exclamation point. In your opinion, will we see a return and in what form? We're not going to see a crypto war return in terms of restrictions on cryptography itself. I think the next crypto war is going to be about cryptocurrency, and we're not quite yet in that war. We're going to be. So um, cryptocurrency is still in its very uh, embryonic state, and when it starts becoming really, really more viable, there's going to be a big 
uh, debacle in government intervention in terms of that, and it will be another crypto war. So I would say yes, based on cryptocurrency. Adam G, is there really that much of a need for a BDC, bullet drop compensated reticle? Do you think a one to six optic with a simple crosshair really would have that much of a disadvantage in competition? No, BDCs almost never actually correlate with the ammunition you're using. They always say this is, you know, M855 or this is XM193 or this is 150 grain NATO ball. And it never, I don't know, I've never seen a BDC, and I mean never, actually correlate. You go to 600 meters or 600 yards or whatever it's at, and fire specifically at that line, and it's never quite right. It's close, it's like horseshoes and hand grenades, but it's never right. So do I think that there's a huge advantage in competition? No. If you know your holdovers, uh, you fire for effect, and then you get the hit. Especially with a flat shooting cartridge like 5.56, simple crosshair would work almost as well. Irahia. Carl, do you watch Forgotten Weapons? Well, interesting. Yep. Sometimes. I don't watch all of it. You know, Ian puts out a video a day, and uh, I don't have time to watch a video a day, quite honestly. But I will look through the feed and find the ones that are particularly interesting to me and watch them intermittently. So yes, I do watch, but I don't watch it religiously. Chad R. Has anyone ever competed in your two-gun matches with an SKS and quality stripper clips and completed a match? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A number of times. Um... You mentioned quality stripper clips. I think there's truth to that. The TAPCO ones, for example, are problematic. And uh, they have completed the match and completed stages. So the SKS can be used. You are fighting uphill the whole way, but it's absolutely possible to shoot two GACM with an SKS and good stripper clips. I would say you are in the obsolescent role, but you are capable. Vincent Jr. Have you ever gotten envious of something Ian has gotten to handle? Envious isn't the word. Uh, I, there's videos that he's been able to go do things that I haven't been able to join him on, which I would wish I could have. The one that most sticks in my mind would be the firing of the fully automatic original uh, Type 2 FG42. Would have liked to have been able to fire that gun in full auto. I fired replicas in semi-auto, but never the real thing. So uh, of all of the ones that really made me go, hmm, wish I could have been there for that, it would have been the Type 2 FG42. Philip W., in range has the best firearms content on the net for information and entertainment. Thank you. As an engineer, your Q&A series of facts has become my favorite. Do you have any plans to do Q&As with other firearm component or firearms manufacturers? Um, yeah, we will uh, when when the situation lends itself to do it. Right now, there isn't one to do that with that really we're working with, but I'm sure we will bring some content like that again back to the channel, and I agree. It's really interesting stuff. Peter G. Do suppressors reduce the accuracy of a firearm? Um, a good one won't, um, but you may see point of impact shift. A really high-end quality suppressor should do nothing. You should put it on, your zero should remain the same or close, and it should not do anything to your group size. Um, a bad one could, of course, especially if you're getting, like, you're getting bullet kisses at the end of the cap or something like that. That'll throw things to hell. But you will probably notice a shift of point of impact, and so you're going to want to know that you index the suppressor the same way every time you put it on or get one that's so high-end that you don't have to worry about it. D-Chill. In light of the Levergun series, do you think the Merwin and Holbert revolvers are actually any faster to reload than a contemporary Colt SAA? Oh, absolutely. Merwin and Holbert, you push this lever, you turn it, you pull the barrel forward, and the spent cartridge cases just fall out, close it, spin it, and reload what chambers were empty at that point. It's absolutely faster than a single-action army where you have to eject each individual case manually. However, the Merwin and Holbert is not the best combat solution from the period. The best answer was the Schofield, which you could use your thumb to open, click it open, cartridge cases all fly out, even the loaded ones, but who cares? Load all five or six, depending on the gun, close it up. So um, the Merwin and Holbert is definitely better than the single action army, but the Schofield is better than the Merwin and Holbert. Matia S. In Poland, there's a weird law where basically anything black powder and muzzle loading is unregulated, including cap and ball. You can open or conceal carry them. What would you carry, open or concealed? Well, concealed is always the answer for carry, so that's easy. Open carry has almost no application in the real world. Um, if you are an open carry person, that's fine, but I'm saying, tactically speaking, it doesn't make sense. Uh, if I were to carry a cap and ball revolver because of strange requirements such as this, I would want to carry a cut-down 1860 Colt. Um, sometimes they're referred to as an avenging angel. <laughs> if you look into the Mormon Danites, they were a gun of the choice of those people. 
Um, they are an 1860 Colt with the barrel shut down, sometimes with a front sight, hopefully a front sight. But imagine a very snub-nosed 1860 Colt. Really easy to carry, reliable cap and ball revolver, the, the most reliable one, really, in my opinion, and um, has the power of being a 45 caliber round ball or a Spitzer bullet. Chance H. Thoughts on digital rifle scopes such as the ATM X Sight 2? Um, sure. Uh, I'm not opposed to such a thing. I think digital rifle scopes are going to become more and more a thing in the future. I think right now they're a little ahead of themselves. Um, and regular glass and optics work really well. And so you got to really have something that's super advantageous as to why would I want electronics in this thing when I can do it with glass and metal and aluminum. So I think that's going to happen. I think we're going to see a future of that. And I'm not opposed to them, but right this minute, I don't know about the ATN X Sight 2, to be honest with you. But um, uh, we're not quite there yet. John H. Regarding ammunition for the M1 Garand, would a load with the same bullet weight and similar muzzle velocity to M2 ball produce a similar chamber pressure and op rod speed? Yeah, it's interesting you say this. So op rod speed and chamber pressures are not necessarily 100% indicated by just velocity uh, of the, the projectile. So... M2 ball has an M150 grain bullet moving at, you know, a certain amount, a certain speed. I think it's 2,800 feet per second, 27, if I remember correctly. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but that's my memory right this moment. But the powder you choose matters greatly. Um, the original AR-15, when it was issued in Vietnam, they switched the powder, powder, even though it should have been a similar projectile velocity. And that powder was not really as compatible with the semi-DI system of the AR that the powder it was originally designed for causing pressure curves and spikes that were not designed for the system, decreasing dwell time, changing things, ripping cases, leaving cases in the chamber, etc. So that's an example of changing powders while not changing bullet weight or velocity was a dramatic problem. And changing powders in your M1 Garand, even though you get the same bullet weight and similar muzzle velocity, does not necessarily mean that you're not overpressuring the gun or running the op rod at an inappropriate speed. So just matching speed and bullet weight does not mean you're actually really cre creating M2 ball. I hope that makes sense. Scott W. Do you think a series of high-power magazine-fed automatic pellet guns could be viable for a two-gun match in a place where firearms are restricted? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, you have to be very close range. Actually, believe it or not, there have been indoor cowboy action shooting matches with paintball guns, uh, with paint pellets, or even BBs. Um, it's doable, but it absolutely minimizes and you lose a lot of the training opportunity that comes from shooting real guns. So if you were pushed into uh, no alternative but that, could you practice and train with that? Yes. But I want that to be my definitive solution? No. Probably Satan. Any good tips for stopping glasses from fogging all to hell? Uh, well, I mean, there's wipes and stuff for that. You know what I use? Spit. Um, spit on your glasses, wipe it off. That goes a really long way, and you can manufacture it yourself. So your saliva wiped on the inside of your glass and then wiped off will be a very good solution most of the time to helping with fogging issues. Ferris, join the new content, asking for a month or so or back. But if you're handed free reign with an HBO, Netflix, Amazon series about someone from the Old West, who would it be and why? I've got two right off the bat, two that come to mind immediately. Actually, I got three. Let me give you three of them, all from southeastern Arizona. Um, the first one that comes to mind is Mickey Free. Um, he was a young boy that was captured by Apaches during an Apache raid that the cavalry thought were the Chiricahua, um, or, were led by Cochise, and it turned out they were not the ones that abducted the boy, but in the process of the negotiations where the cavalry and U.S. Army determined that they knew that Cochise had done it, they abducted some of Cochise's uh, siblings, children, as um, collateral to get Mickey Free back. This turned into the longest Indian War with the Apaches that went from 1860s into the 1890s, all based on Mickey Free. Mickey Free landed up becoming, he was um, a uh, in Indian scout slash bounty hunter, and he was a very tough, hard man. Um, incredible stories about him. He never felt comfortable in the white man's world or the indigenous people world or with the Apaches or the Mexicans. He felt like he didn't belong anywhere, spoke multiple languages, and was a general badass. Um, Mickey Free is well worth doing an entire series on. Two others that come to mind, uh, Dr. Goodfellow from Tombstone, otherwise known as the uh, gunfighter's surgeon, absolutely progressed the science of medicine and trauma medicine in a way that no other doctor really did. Incising wounds, cleaning wounds, stitching uh, your guts back together, removing the bullet, not just sticking his dirty finger in there, but literally surgically dealing with it. He saved many people who had gunshot wounds. He was also a boxer, 
uh, an army veteran, doctor army, a doctor, he was an army doctor and veteran, um, uh, general badass as well. So Dr. Goodfellow is another one. And the last one is Nellie Cashman. Um, not in any particular order, by the way, also a tombstonian. She was a female frontiers woman that was an incredible, uh, incredibly empathetic and humanist. She did a lot of things for the mining camp she lived in, not only Tombstone, but up in Alaska during the Gold Rush in Nome. Um, she ran restaurants and stores, was an activist in terms of being, in terms of some of the death penalty things that went on, for example, the Bisbee Massacre and the mass hanging there. She organized a destruction of the gallows at the time because she didn't believe in um, uh, capital punishment, or at least not in this instance. Whether you agree with her or not, that shows that she had a lot of sand, to use the terminology of the day. And she was a woman that did this all without a man. She did it on her own. Uh, and she was always well-respected and everyone loved her, no matter where she went. So those are the three that come to mind. Mickey Free, Dr. Goodfellow, and Nellie Cashman. I would advise you to Google all of them and read their stories. Um, I do want to do in-range Old West vignettes about all three of them and hope to someday. I was working on Dr. Goodfellow. His story is so overwhelming, I realize this is going to have to be three or four or five parts. And it's something that I've kind of written, but I haven't gotten on tape yet, or camera. I think it'll get there. Gory the All-Powerful. For the Lever Gun Project, did you give any thought to the Marlin or Colt Burgess rifles? For Jess. No, I didn't. Um, I've shot Marlins. They are not as good as the Winchester equivalents, in my opinion. I shot them in cowboy action. If they malfunction, they have problems for clearing issues. They are just a more complex gun with little benefit. The Colt or Jess was not really something that was very prominent in the Old West. There was a Colt started making lever action guns at the time, and Colt was at that time making pistols, and Winchester was making lever guns. And they had a gentleman's agreement. They came to the table and said, Winchester said, if you keep making them lever guns, we're gonna start making pistols. And if you're willing to stop making lever guns, we will not make pistols. And that left Colt open to being the, essentially the, the, the definitive pistol of the Old West, and it left Winchester to be the definitive lever gun of the Old West. So they kind of did that together. However, the Winchester was the better gun anyway. The Colt Burgess loading system had this strange loading gate that closed every time you tried to stuff a cartridge in, worse than the Kingsgate loading pattern in a large way, it was like a door. Um, not as good, and the ergonomics weren't as good either. So the Marlin has reliability issues, and the Colt just wasn't better than the Winchester. So they were not included in the lever gun project because they were, in my opinion, definitively inferior to the ones we've already chosen. Dayton R. Just watched the Desert Tech video and the less than optimal results. In a 7.62 NATO chambered semi-automatic rifle, what would be your choice and why? Two come to mind. Uh, the Scar H is a fantastic rifle. We have some video on the, on the channel about it. It does destroy optics, but it's a reliable 308 battle rifle and modern in every way. And the other one that comes to mind is the G3. The delayed roller system is the most reliable thing ever in 308, and it will run everything. It'll run Wolf, it'll run steel case, it'll run high end, it'll run low end, and there's no adjustable gas system to futz with. It just works. So those are the two that I would think about. JC. Does InRange have any experience with the downward ejecting action of the Caltech RDP bullpup, and what are its what are its opinions on Caltech's solution to the bullpup ejection question? Um, yeah, we have a whole video about the Caltech rifle on the channel, and I think that their their method of it, having it go further back and eject out the bottom is really good. The PS90 ejects out the bottom as well. Excuse me, not the back, the bottom. Absolutely ambidextrous. The only issue I had with it was that you could get your hand in the way and cause a malfunction if you were doing something unusual with how you were holding the gun. And when you were shooting prone, sometimes the brass would eject out forcefully and into your shirt, into you. Um, minor problem. So I would say that Caltech's solution of ejecting out the bottom is actually a really good one and worth investigation for other bullpup designs if one is so inclined to make a bullpup. The other thing is, of course, it is simple. And if you open the action, you can still look down in there and see into the chamber in a way you can't in the MDR or many other bullpups that are designed to be ambidextrous like the FS2000. Well, that's all the questions for this month. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this Q&A. Um, again, it's our Patreon supporters at $5 and above that have the ability to provide us these questions. We much appreciate your support. You are keeping in range alive and we appreciate your continued support through this debacle that's going on with Patreon. Just leaving a, a Patreon there does, of course, affect Patreon, but more importantly, it affects the content creators the worst. And if you need to, if you want to see in range stay alive, we will decentralize on Patreon when we can, but please give us a chance to do it and wait for there to be a viable alternative to do so. If you're not already supporting us on Patreon, please consider it. If you uh, can't, 
Please, of course, subscribe to one of our channels. You can follow all of them on inrange.tv and share with your friends. Thank you very much.